All right, and we're live. So we're here with Christo von Rinsberg. Uh, Christo, I, I was going to start with um, all of your career accomplishments, but I think that would take up the entire show. So I'll go with the brief highlights. Um, you have singles wins over uh, a bunch of former number one uh, players, including Pete Sampras and straight sets at Wimbledon. You were the number one doubles team in the world with Paul Anacone. You won the Australian Open in 1985. Uh, and now you're the captain for the South African uh, Davis Cup team. You're a former Olympian um, and a lot of other accomplishments that I don't uh, or that we don't have time to mention. Uh, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Will, for reaching out to me. And uh, I've been checking into your... Uh stuff you've been doing and it it's great what you're doing i know it takes a lot of work and effort and always great when you see a lot of people following you and hopefully more will sign up unless i chase them away <laughs> well hopefully you'll bring more uh more to the podcast than uh chasing them away but yeah i was really looking forward to this conversation because obviously uh it's a doubles podcast and anytime we can talk to someone who uh, is one of the best doubles players uh, of all time. Um, that's a great opportunity. Uh, but in the past, I've mostly had uh, current or at least uh, more recent players. So I'm excited to dive into kind of how the doubles game has evolved. Um, but one place I wanted to start, uh, when I was doing, doing some research, I found that um, I found an interview uh, with you, and I don't know when this was done because it wasn't dated, but uh, with the Capital Area Tennis Association there in Austin, Texas, where you live, and they asked you which modern players remind you of yourself when you played, and you said Taylor Townsend. Uh, why is that? Well, you know, when you see someone in the U.S. Open on the biggest stage, play a women's tennis match or a men's for inter for uh, explanation purposes mm -hmm. and they go 109 times to the net in one match <laughs> you are really enjoying that because that is so old school but mm -hmm. I think the game I've talked to a lot of people at the top the baseline game is soon going to be plateaued there's only so much you can do from the baseline. Mm -hmm. So you either going to have to find ways that uh, either go to the net, move people forward, backwards, or find something. So that could be the way you get your ranking up and go past the rest of the people. There are so many people that Lendl uses the phrase west to east, west to east. Mm -hmm. And they are so good in it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's why when someone decides to move forward or back with you, you kind of, you kind of have to say you like that. Yeah. It's a pity. I hope she makes a comeback. I know she had a kid, someone said, but I hope she yeah. makes a comeback. And I'm running professional tennis tournaments here in Austin. Maybe she'll call me and come and play in my events. <laughs> Absolutely. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Her the match that comes to mind was I, I think she beat Halep in the U.S. Open. I watch every match she played. It was amazing yeah. how she made people panic. Yeah. Until they sorted it out way deeper into the tournament. Yeah. But yeah. well done for us. So excited. It's just nice to see someone have or do something differently. You yeah. know. Yeah, absolutely. So I take it when you played, you didn't spend a lot of time at the baseline then. You know, in the warm-up I did, yeah. and uh, my coach forced me to play one point a game from the back. And that was like a death sentence for me. Why do I have to do it? Now, obviously, he explained why, and it, mm -hmm. it paid off in my singles career. But wow, was I happy when I got that one point from the baseline out of the way and I could look at him and then say, are you satisfied now? I played your one point from the back. I'm going forward. And I mean, uh, we'll get to the doubles, but uh, yeah, we'll was talk it one about point, that stuff. Did you say one point per game? 
Yeah, listen, I came in on first serve returns, second serve returns, I serve volley every ball, because in tennis, you want to use what your weapons are. Mm -hmm. That's another subject we can go way deep in. Sure. So why force me to play and do things that other people can do? And then I'll give you a great example. I was in South Africa in December. That's where I'm from. So we, I live in Austin, Texas. So there's always four to five weeks in December. You would go home and two weeks in April. That's the only time I got to see my family. And I remember I was training there and I really worked on my ground shots. So I got to the Australian Open. My coach flew from uh, New York, Peter Fishback. That was amazing coach. He only coached three players. The one won the Australian Open, Peter Fishback. Uh, he coached Brian Teacher, who won the Australian Open singles. Then he coached Manstorf, that was 18 in the world from Israel. And I always say I was his suck player that only got to 19. <laughs> So he obviously knew a lot about the game and I'm still very good friends with him. So I, I arrived the first two days. I said, you've got to check out how good my ground shots are. And he said, you know, it's very good, but there's probably three or 400 people in the world that hits it the same as you and better. But when you go to the net, there's a lot less. So which one do you want to play? Yeah. So I said, you know, you make me so mad when you say that stuff. And <laughs> anyway, I went to the net again. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it worked out for you. So uh, I want to talk about um, uh, the, uh, we've touched on this already with Taylor Townsend, how she's so unique in today's game. Um, but as far as doubles goes, how have you seen uh, the modern doubles game kind of compare to when you played in the 80s and 90s? How has it transitioned? I think when you look back, you had to win at the net. It was just mm -hmm. how the game was structured. Mm -hmm. Now I see a lot more and probably why is because in tennis, you have to use your weapons. So when you look at the modern game, do you think that people have better ground shots than volleys? In yeah. our time, it was the opposite. The good players had better volleys than ground shots and it kind of evolved. So I can see now in the modern game that people are serving and staying back. Mm -hmm. And rightly so. The problem I have is that coaches want the players to go to the net to put pressure on. Mm -hmm. And I buy into that. But remember, if your player is not good at the net, you're putting him in a position where he knows that's not his A game. So what's going to happen when it gets really crunch time and the heart rate goes to 180 and just going? Yeah. They're not going to make 100 balls or 90 out of 100 because they're nervous. And I got a book from... Uh, Billy Knight, the guy that, the basketball coach, he signed it for me that was at Ohio State, I think. Is that correct? The basketball uh, Indiana? coach. Indiana? Bob? Yeah, Indiana. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. And he signed a book. And there was this one line that he said to me, when you really need things to happen that's important, make sure your players are in their best positions. Mm-hmm. So because coaches are from my era, they want to get the players to the net because they could do it. But right. it's a fine line of doing that to some players that are just better. I mean, Lendl said it one day also great to me because Lendl and Gomez play doubles. They were two baseliners and they played completely the different way than all the top other teams. And they were very good. I think they were in the top eight teams in the world when they played together. Mm -hmm. And then they'll said one day, you're going to come watch us play doubles. I said, why? You never play doubles. He says, come and watch. Gomez is going to be on the juice side. He has a huge forehand. I'm going to be on the ad side. I have a huge forehand. We're going to stand behind the doubles alley. And they're not going to get any ball to our back ends. And we're going to rip and rip and dip forehands. And they're going to not know where to volley. And we're going to take them to the cleaners. And rightly so. They put themselves in position by hitting forehands. And they were the two, two of the best forehands in the game. Yeah. Did so now if they would play now, 
Sorry. Uh -huh. If they play now for a coach, what do you think the coach is going to say? He's probably going to say, hey, you got to get to the net. you got to get to the net. Yeah. That I do understand. I'm not blaming anyone. Yeah. But you've got to understand where your player is the best and find a game plan so he can use his weapons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, so why – so it sounds like you said when you were playing – the strengths of the players were at the net and then players today are more comfortable at the baseline. Why, why do you think that's changed? This is hard because I'm not there in the middle of it. You know, these are questions probably for the guys who are commentating there. Okay. I would say that in our times, everything was a lot faster. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like, you know, uh, you got to start doing something because you can't just keep running every ball down. Yeah. And most, I mean, just before I started, you know, 10 years before me, that gave the three grand slams on grass. So there was a lot of that stuff, also the surface and the balls. Mm -hmm. A lot of people now feel that because of the equipment, the ball right. is just coming so much faster. And because of the strings, the ball has got a lot more shape. So mm -hmm. if you're not familiar at the net and this just kind of evolved, you know, and then one or two guys do really well at the back, like Agassi started, then everyone thinks, okay, they want to play like him. I have a feeling my philosophy is now, if there's a 14 year old or 15 year old now that could become a really good at the net in five years, everyone is going to want to copy him again. Right. You know, so I think it's a cycle thing. It's going to have to happen. The yeah. baseline game, like I said, is getting plateaued. Right. Yeah, it makes sense that that, that it would cycle because um, typically with, you know, any sport uh, or any, any type of system like that, the, you know, if you're slightly different than everyone else, then that's going to be like a strategic advantage, right? Because, you know, if I'm playing against a bunch of baseliners and then I come up against Taylor Townsend who serves in volleys, I'm naturally not going to be used to it, right? So it's... She beat balls. the number one in the world. By right. making a panic. Right. I mean, that should tell everyone, you should become creative. You should have a coach that's creative. Mm -hmm. Find out if you have something that we can use in a match. I saw the other day a girl that is 200 in the world that trained here with my player the other day. She chipped a forehand when it was short. I was shocked how good it was. Mm -hmm. And I'm like thinking, I wonder if she had a coach, if the coach would say, hey, take that shot away. you got to hit a four on top, but no one slices a four in. But I tell you, it was as good as the best slice I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. So now it's hard. I don't know what's going to happen with her, but she's obviously doing something that a lot of people are not going to know how to counter that shot. So she was doing it on all of her forehands? Or just no, just kind of moving forward and it was low. Okay. So now take example, if she rallies and rallies and rallies and doesn't get a short ball or get something to control the point, mm -hmm. you need variety. Are you going to yeah. hit one high or one low? Are you going to hit one harder or softer? You cannot go just boom, 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 boom and don't get what you're looking for because then you're going to start having errors after your fifth or sixth or seven, because you're just going to go subconsciously yeah. bigger and bigger and bigger and take more risks. Right. Game doesn't work like that. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. So um, I want to jump into to your story. So just walk us through um, how you grew up in South Africa. How did you get started in tennis? Uh, I assume you played um a lot of singles as well as doubles growing up. Just take us through your, your full kind of story, how you got to the pro level. I'm going to have to try and, f if I go over two or three minutes, you got to stop me because I remember okay. this answer took me 20 minutes on a previous Zoom and I realized okay. uh, not good. So anyway, uh, my parents were just like three, five level players. And I would just go and watch them, you know, when they played weekend leagues in South Africa and, I played three sports at a high level in school, was cricket, rugby, and tennis. And gradually I let go at 12, I let go of rugby. And at, and at age 18, 
I had to decide tennis or cricket, I had to pick. I was never really great in tennis in, uh, in my school years. I was only ranked in South Africa 21 under 18 in South Africa. And my parents didn't really have money. They were school teachers, mm -hmm. but we were never poor. We never felt poor. So I stopped playing tennis at the age of 18. And a month later, uh, that ended up being my father-in-law passed away now because I married his daughter on his way. So uh, they just called me out of the blue and they said, uh, his son that's a year younger than me, lives in Pretoria. It was then Joburg, sorry, Joburg then. Come and stay six months with us and practice with him every day on the court. We have a court because I signed up well, not signed up, you had to go to the Defense Force in South Africa for two years, either before yeah. you go to college or after college. So during that six months, if I, he didn't call me, I would have stopped playing tennis. So one call changed my life. Wow. Went to play there six months. He felt after three months on the tennis court ball machine every day, I had nothing to do, to wait until the kids come out of school at four o'clock to play with them. He felt, wow, he's getting good. And he called the South African Tennis Federation and he says, you have an under 21 grass court tournament. There's eight guys. He's not good on ranking. You should put him in. And they gave me a wild card because of him calling. And I won the tournament. Oh, wow. And that changed my whole life because now all the selectors started seeing, wow, this guy from a small town in Utenaik, South Africa, he just beat all our seven guys who got in on ranking. So that's kind of how the whole process started. I still went to the army. And then after the army, I turned pro. I did have a full scholarship to go to college after high school, even at 21 rank, but we couldn't afford the air tickets. My dad just said, how are we going to get you there and back? That means you leave forever. So I just gave up tennis. It was hard. Yeah. So a phone call changed my life. And I never looked back. Wow. So you, so you were on the court every day for, for six months and you're... Yeah, suddenly you have no school. You have no commitment. Yeah, you have yeah. no commitment. And my mother-in-law, she coached. And this family was the best family, tennis family in South Africa. They had uh, three kids and three of the four, four kids, three of the four were number one in South Africa in their age groups. I mean, my wife played Wimbledon at the age of 16. And my wife's sister played junior Wimbledon final at the age of 15. Gosh. So uh, it's an amazing family. It's a good environment. <laughs> yeah, and the brother got a full scholarship to come here. So, so what were you doing every day? Would you wake up and just start playing matches or were you all doing drills? Or No, well, it was just me and my mother-in-law. And the ball machine. So we would have this ball machine that we would run and do targets. You'll have 12, 20 balls mm -hmm. that will go side to side, or you would have a, you know, you'll just move and count how many times you could hit the ball in the target. And okay. then at four o'clock in the afternoons, uh, the brother-in-law were coming, coming to out of school. So we would play sets. And then in the evening, I would play with the father, or I would play with someone else that the mother is coaching. So I'm just sadly hitting balls hours and hours yeah. on the court. Wow. And it just went yeah. just like that. I was very dedicated. And I am, I'm, I, I'm mm -hmm. still, I still am. If I take on something, I go beyond the call of duty. And that's just how my, how I was brought up and how I do it. Right. So then from there, you uh, start your pro career. Um, you're around 20, 21 years old. Yeah, and I was fortunate because from my hometown, there was a Michael Myberg that was about 200 in the world. So he says, you want to play doubles with me? Mm -hmm. Wow. And obviously, yeah, I'm traveling with a guy that's been out there already four or five years. And the first three tournaments we played, we won. So suddenly, a little bit of money is coming in. I have travel expenses that I can cover. Yeah. And so when you start winning tournaments, other players see it and they ask you to play. And, you know, I was also lucky when I was about 12, 13, 14 years old. Uh, Linky Bosov, who played doubles with on the tour with uh, Ilana uh, Kloss, that now runs World Team Tennis and with Billie Jean King. 
they won the US Open doubles. So every time she came home, I would practice with her and hit with her. And what an honor that was. Mm -hmm. So I was blessed. I was really blessed uh, of the people that were around me. And I had really great parents who just supported. You know, they never got involved, but they just supported. And shame, looking back now, I know it cost them a lot of money driving and staying in hotels. So at what point, uh, so you start, you turn pro at 20 or 21. At, at what point did you realize, okay, this is, this is a career for me. Like I'm a legitimate top 20 player in the world, or at least that potential. I don't know when I knew, when I knew about goals about a ranking, but when mm -hmm. you just go out of the army and you go to Europe and you won it, would, it was kind of equivalent to the 25,000s that are now out. Okay. And you win the first two you play, and then you went to America. It was in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, you play an ATP tour event. And I mm -hmm. think at those years, those were like 150s or 125s. That was similar to the 250s now we have in 500s. Sure. And here you play guys who played at Wimbledon. And we right. ended up beating them to win the whole tournament. And I'm thinking, wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm like thinking, this is like life. You play and you get money to play. You know, you're from this, you're kind of naive at that stage. Then you knew, I think I can make money. I can keep going. There's enough money to keep going. Mm -hmm. And the more you see that, the harder you work. Mm -hmm. So uh, you said you were naive at that age. So one of my questions for you was going to be, uh, what, what advice would you give yourself at, uh, say, like 20, 21 years old? About? Let's say you could go back to immediately after you won that tournament in Cleveland, and you can tell yourself anything. You have, say, two minutes to talk, talk to yourself. What would you say? I probably, you know, I'm a big Christian. So at that stage, you know, you go on your knees every time and you say thank you for, you know, just being able to do this for the talent you got and for letting me be at that stage, you're obviously not, you're injury free. So you're thankful for what there is. And then you're looking at, you know, that hopefully you will make good decisions moving forward. Can you be with people that can help you? Because remember, you're on your own. And, you know, if I can get to this level that I've just did in a matter of three weeks, mm -hmm. If I work harder and even harder than I already did work hard. So I, I, right. I always maxed out. Yeah. Then there is more possibilities. And I think what was in the back of my mind, when you start making these checks and you know how hard your brother and your mom and your dad work for their money, you kind of feel, wow, I know they're enjoying me doing this and it feels like maybe their support was all worth it now. And you just keep going. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, so now you're, you're through Cleveland. Uh, I assume you, you continue to play tournaments and some of them, uh, some of them you win, some of them you don't. At what point did you start playing uh, with Paul Anacone? And, and y'all went on to win uh, the Australian Open. Y'all were the number one doubles team in the world for a time. Well, the thing what I always tell people and while I'm coaching now, because what is the hardest thing now when your player plays? They work so hard and you work them hard and you get their confidence up and they go and they lose and they come back and they do it again. And all coaches, we all run into this thing with our players. So just to let you know, it was never easy in the beginning because what happened is I think because I 
started doing well. I got to start playing with all these guys that are at college in America and they were tournaments. And then South Africa was banned to play for the country. So what they did because of the apartheid during those years, so they had some teams from America and Europe and stuff come in as just, you know, have some tournament like team events. And I got to meet Anna Cohn that came to South Africa and we got to, you know, hang out. And the year after that, I ended up, went to England and qualified for Queens and lost to Paul Anacone in the third round. I had an amazing week. And we had a close match. You know, I thought it was close. He probably doesn't think it was close. <laughs> And suddenly we developed kind of a friendship and he always played with Eric Kurita that had one of the biggest serves. Mm -hmm. And in Australia, we were just there one year, Kurita got injured about 15 minutes before the deadline of this warm up tournament before Australia, he called me up. He says, Christo, do you want to play doubles this week? And I didn't really have a partner. And I said, yes, I was going to just hang around to sign up. That's how it started. We were match point down in the first match. Yeah. We won it. We won the tournament. Had we lost that match point, we probably would never have played together because we gave right. it a go. We were good friends, but it's not like, you know, yeah. he was the number one player in American college, so he could get anyone to play with him. Yeah. So I always say God works in mysterious ways, man. Yeah, that's crazy. So I had two lucky breaks. Right. The My late father-in-law called me up after I, after I stopped tennis. Mm -hmm. I found a partner that ended up we made, uh, ended up gave, gave me a great career, Paul Anico, but we right. were match point down in our first match ever, and then won the tournament. So were you you were signed up just for singles for that tournament then? No, I was looking for doubles, but at that stage you're kind of trying to see who you're going to play with and you're not really excited about people that are looking for partners. And then you kind of borderline on the cutoff. Okay. So you kind of wait, well, someone that's maybe a higher ranking ask you. Right. And it just worked out that his player, his partner got injured and he was high. So he asked me, yeah. he probably could have yeah. asked a lot of other guys. So thank yeah. you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it, you also reached uh, number 19 in the world in singles. Um, so top 20, you... hey, top, top 20 sounds a lot better. Top 20. And 19. <laughs> 20. We won't worry about the specific. No, 19 is totally fine. <laughs> 19's nothing to be ashamed of. So either Thank one you. is uh, pretty good. Um, so how did you balance? Uh, it, it sounded like your first three tournaments, you win doubles. Uh, you start playing with Paul Anacone in doubles. Where does singles fall into all this? What was very interesting, when Paul and I started doing well, mm -hmm. they had this ranking system that every year starts at zero, and there was just a bonus pool of money at the end. Mm -hmm. So because we had a really good start to the first, to the year, because we won uh, the Miami tournament that was just played, when we won that, it was in Kibis Kane. Suddenly, as a team, we now are lying ahead and everyone is going for the bonus pool at the end of the year. And you know now there's a chance you can get money. Mm -hmm. So we every week where Paul went to play singles because he was in, I went. But because we went to the quarters or the semis, I couldn't get to the next tournament and play singles qualifying because at that stage, I was ranked 287. Uh, 300, 250, I'm in that range. Right. Couldn't get in. So that's why my ranking, sorry, the ranking was about 120, but because of that doubles run we started, it dropped all, all the way to 300 because I couldn't defend any points because uh, I just went doubles. Yeah, but yeah. because I'm practicing with him every day and he's moving up and up and up, and yeah, I have a guy mm -hmm. that went to 11 in the world, I'm practicing with him every day. And he was amazing because he would every day say to me, your break is going to come. And I would start winning points and games of him in the practices. Mm -hmm. And then my coach who helped me also was a friend of Lendl. 
So just being able to practice with these people gave me confidence that I am going to get my break. I just can't get to these tournaments. Mm -hmm. So we just kind of hung in there and somehow I got some small breaks and the ranking started moving up and then the singles caught up with the doubles. Okay. So, so when was that break? Did you? That was, I think, the year after the Australian. Okay. I think the Australian was uh, December, I think. And then uh, Miami was the next year in April. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, so to stick with doubles, um, what did you feel like? Uh, this can be the beginning of your career, the end of your career, the, the entire career. Um, what, what did you feel like you specifically did on the doubles court better than anyone else? Pick a partner. <laughs> <laughs> what about the this thing you did second best? Okay. To Listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was fortunate. Uh, I... Uh, I had very good people around me and Paul was obviously very good, but uh, we can get into doubles. Doubles for me is a lot about chemistry. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that I've played with a lot of other number ones and we laugh at it now if him and I talk about it because you know the Woodf Woodford and Woodbridge, mm -hmm. they were like the Bryan brothers during our time from Australia and we had this one tournament in Atlanta. Woodford is not playing. So Woodbridge said to me, and he was one in the world. He said to me, you want to play doubles? And I said, yeah. I mean, when a number one player in the world asks you to play doubles or anyone, you say yes. We were suck together. Yeah. And we still laugh about it. We scrambled to win points as a team. We lost first round. The next week he went back to play with his partner. They won a tournament and I played with Anacone again and we did well again. Sure. So I think chemistry is more important than the ranking because right. you have to understand how to play together. So then what do you think you and Paul did better than other teams? If you look at how we played, we combined really well in playing uh, a certain kind of strategy. Mm -hmm. So Paul liked to, he played always like that. And I kind of got more into it as I was more with him. He used to come in on everything. Okay. I remember he played uh, uh, in uh, Los Angeles. He beat Stefan Edberg, 7-6, 7-7-6. And there was not one ground shot hit in the whole match because we played the doubles final right after that. Yeah. So because my net game was my weapon and my return was my weapon, we combined really well because his weapon was serve again. Mm. And we both could return well and we both could volley well. So we only had one game every four games that was a weakness in our kind of in our Your arsenal or whatever you call it. And that really helped us. So okay. we could, he was good at the net, so he could move around, help me hold my serve. Mm -hmm. And because he served so big, I think he had one of the top three biggest serves in the game when we started out. So no one could get any rhythm returning. So when I served, they really were kind of maybe even more nervous because they felt we have to break him. And they haven't really returned for four games because he just served aces and so hard. Right. So we had a really good combination of where we were good and how are we going to hide our weaknesses. And he was just a very great guy to play with. I'll give you a great example because you need to know what a great guy Paul Anakin was on the tennis court. He was a juice side player. I was ad side. And uh, we can talk about who should play juice, who should play ad. We all have different sure. opinions about that. And this specific, this specific one match, although I would say that if we both good in returning, I felt I was maybe the more consistent returner. Mm -hmm. But at this match, 
he was just like, it was like we in Vegas, wherever we bet, we winning. Doesn't matter what we play in Vegas. Mm-hmm. And I had break point and break point and it was just love 15, it goes back to 15 or and then after a while, when you're not making anything on the ad side, you start kind of doubt, you know, and you start pressing and you, so he walked up to me and he, and he laughs at me and I'm not really, I say, what are you laughing? I don't need to see your smiley face right now. I am struggling. <laughs> and he says, I'm just going to tell you that today I'm so lucky that I'm playing on the Jew side because these guys are serving so well to you. I don't want to be on your side. And to me, they just can't serve because they're not serving that good. So we use a psychology to kind of make me feel, listen, doesn't matter who is going to return on the ad. You just go and try your best. No one is going to return their serve. Right. Listen, I know you was lying, but the way that chemistry evolved um, between him and me was I'm very big on how you communicate with your player. When is the time to help them? When is the time for support? And that's what makes a doubles team. You, what makes a doubles team good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's really good advice. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I do a seminar. I do a seminar sometimes, uh, you know, just about, uh, you know, positive coaching and positive call talking and how people should explain and things like that. And right. it's amazing how something positive is always going to be better than if you want to coach someone. If you want to coach someone all the time, they're going to get the feeling that they're not doing good pressure. enough. They're not doing anything right. correct. Right. Yeah, that puts kind of unfair pressure on people. Um, 100%. And it's, yeah, it's something it's kind of surprising to me how, how often I'll see not it, not even just coaching, but uh, you know, when I play in these USTA tournaments or leagues um, I'll see partners who are struggling returning on one side, for example, um, like you said, and the other partner will be over on their half of the court, like shaking their head or like, you know, getting frustrated with them. And it's like, how do you think they're going to start returning well with you giving them negative feedback like that? Like, how's that going to do anything but make it worse? Like, do you want to win as a doubles team or do you like want somebody to blame when you lose? And it's crazy to me, but um, yeah, it does happen. Some people don't get it. Uh, it happens 99% of the time. Right. It's really and, strange. And also, you know, it's interesting just as an individual player, I sometimes just go to the courts and I you just listen. Have you ever mm-hmm. seen anyone play and play and play and hit a great shot and say something out loud what a good shot they hit? And they could hit 10 or 12. You can watch them. They miss one shot. They verbally have to say something about that shot they just missed. Right. It happens all the time. Right. It's the most fun thing just to watch. And you kind of think, how are they going to feel better now on the next shot? They just talk themselves that it was the worst shot they played. They can't play this. They never make this shot, but they just made 12 or 13 other ones and they didn't say anything. Yeah. There is no perfection in tennis. It's just never going to happen. Uh-uh. It's a, I, I learned this the other day. It's a moment. If you hit a great shot, it was perfect. Enjoy the moment. It was just a flash. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One, one thing that's changed that a lot for me, um, is, uh, and this is, we were talking before the call about, uh, my work with Warren Pretorius at tennis analytics. Then I've also worked with Craig O'Shaughnessy over at brain game tennis. And he, um, he has this stat he likes to use in a lot of his seminars of like the, the number one player in the world wins 53% of their points. Um, and that, when I first heard that, that kind of blew my mind and, and changed my perspective on like losing points, right? It's like, you're going to lose around half of the points you play, regardless of if you win or lose the match. So, you know, losing a point is not going to be uh, the end of the world. In fact, you, you can sometimes lose points and set up future points, you know? Um, 
So anyways, that's, that's, yeah, that's a really good topic we could dive into. I have this story that I tell people, mm -hmm. think of a guy that's going to surf in the, on the, in the, in, on the ocean. He's going to want to catch a wave. So he mm -hmm. swims out there, swims, he gets the wave. He's on top of the wave. He's surfing. That's mm -hmm. when you win the points. You're not surfing the whole match. You're not winning all the points. And you're going to fall off. Then the, uh, the opponent are winning points. Now you're swimming back and go and serve again. Right. Can you serve longer than your opponent if we add up the cycles in the match? Right. Can you serve? Can you win three points in a row? Let him only win two. Can you win one, 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 one? You got to become, every time you fall off, climb back up, swim, right. climb back up. You lose a point, climb back in the match, try and win the next point. You lose three, climb back. Sure. And think of that. And my coach was really good in this. Yeah. He says, you're never going to win all the points. Don't even try. Just never yeah. going to happen. What do you do when you lose a point is the most important thing that you can learn about. Sure. How are you going to yeah, handle that's... losing that point? Because it's going to drive you nuts. Anna Cohn had a very good saying. You're going to play a match and divide it in threes. Your top third of the match is you play autopiloting. We go to Vegas, we bet, we'll win every point. <laughs> you go down the line, you play through your legs, you close your eyes, everything works. Great. There's a middle part of a third where you're going to play and it's just going to be... You know, you're going to play hard. You're going to fight. You're going to win. You're going to lose some. You're going to win some. You're in the grind. And then you get to the bottom third. This is when you're just not knowing what's happening today. I mean, this guy is just winning points. You not. What should I do? If you can find a way to be competitive in the bottom third and deal with that, you will become a player. If you cannot play when the chips are down, tennis is not for you. Go and find another sport. It's just not going to happen because you're going to get challenged in every match you play. Mm -hmm. And that's my message to coaches is you've got to find out what is your player going to do when the chips are down? Do you train that part? Do you know that if you watch them and the chips are down, or you're a player and you play, do you know what your steps are going to be? You need right. to be able to know that. Yeah, that's that's really good advice. And I, I like the analogy of the, the surfing because then it's like, it's more about, you know, everybody's going to have their wave and it's it's more about how quickly can you get back up on the surfboard and paddle out to catch the next wave. And if you can kind of shorten that time that you're spending paddling and trying to get back on the surfboard then you can spend more time on the wave and, uh, and, you know, winning more points. Um, yeah. Now you can see I'm a big, I coach by telling stories yeah. because stories, if the story makes sense, mm -hmm. the player can buy into it. Right. You know, and if he believes in the story now, if he plays badly, he, he knows, Hey, the other guy served. I want to go and serve now, you know, and that's how life is. It's how to deal with diversity or things that's going to go wrong. Sure. So storytelling for me is how I, how I coach. Yeah. Yeah. It sticks with people for sure. Um, so I wanted to ask about, so you won the Australian open in 85 with Paul Anacone. Uh, talk a little bit about that. And then um, I think you have a, a picture to show us. Um, we're going to publish this on YouTube, uh, but if anyone's listening, uh, you can go to yes, I do. com slash podcast to, to find all this information. So this so is a picture is, of you and Paul. So, so this is Paul and I winning the Australian Open. And I'll give you something that also happened at the Australian Open because it was on grass and it rained. I don't know if it's ever happened, but we won the Australian Open without playing on the center court the whole tournament. So my Grand Slam title, I never played on the center court. <laughs> wow. But what's very interesting about this picture, 
is there something in this picture that no one will, it will never happen again in sport. Right. I always have this quiz. So, you know, uh, maybe we'll get, when you play this, you might have people, and I don't know if you want me to give you the answer or we'll give it at the end of the, at the end of the podcast, we can give the answer. So you can always delete the answer and put it up later on, but okay. there's something Let's... in this picture that will never happen again. Yeah, let's. That's pretty uh, cool that someone took that picture of Paul and I. Yeah, that's a great picture. Um, so, so let's not give them the answer. Uh, if anyone wants to share their answer, they can reply in the comments. If you're watching this on YouTube or um, reply to the newsletter or anything like that. And uh, if you get the answer correct, uh, I'll send you a Tennis Tribe T-shirt. Um, and uh, we'll include the answer at the very bottom of the show notes. So nobody, uh, nobody, <laughs> che nobody cheat. Um, maybe I'll wait a week or so to, to put, put that up. Um, Charlie, yeah, I have a block on really my good. cell phone if people are going to call me. <laughs> oh, <you're> <laughs> no problem. So uh, let's dive into some strategy. So now you're in Austin, Texas. You're at, uh, at Barton Creek, correct? Yeah, the Omni Barton Creek Spawn Resort, the way Omni put in like 140 million to redo everything. It's really beautiful. They have four golf courses, they have brand new tennis courts with amazing lights. So yeah. uh, very nice setup here at the Omni. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I've played there a few times in Austin and it's probably my favorite facility in the in the city. Um, so uh, are you coaching mostly high level juniors, college players, pro players, uh, club level three, five, four O players. <clears throat> Tell us kind of how you're spending your time now. Okay. So I actually, I'm very blessed now. Uh, I have three, th three sections that I'm involved. Mm -hmm. The first one is I'm running professional tennis tournaments. It's called the drop shot series.com that you can maybe put up. Yep, we are running two twenty-five thousands in for the third year now in Austin, and the founder of Drop Shot is Mr. Brian Sheffield, who is uh, uh, in, in in the energy sector that sold his company now, and he just loves tennis. He's one of the five owners of Austin FC soccer team. Mm -hmm. And he loves tennis, so we started running professional tennis tournaments. We're looking now to bring a third big event next year to Austin. That's in the negotiations. Then I became the Davis Cup captain for South Africa. That just uh, got that a few months ago. So that's a new thing that I'm doing for the next four years. Mm -hmm. Then the third one is... I'm coaching a girl who's 400 in the world who lives here, who's playing currently Fed Cup for Mexico in uh, London this weekend. And the top junior that was 12, 14, and 16s until shame, her coach ran over her foot. They came for three weeks after a year of really not playing, year and a half. So the two of them I'm working with, so people come to Austin. I don't promote, I don't advertise really. I don't coach at a club hour by hour. I do more assignments. Okay. And what I do with the packages is when they come, we give them total support in obviously tennis. And then I am, if you go to mataustin.com, mm -hmm. uh, I will send you the link. It's now the continuum method. I've been with this guy 20 years. It's called muscle activation technique. They make sure all the muscles work. They don't send you to the gym unless they know that your muscles are all firing. Then you get a special program. And they call them like the electrician of the body. Mm -hmm. So they find weaknesses and they add stability. This is by far the top, pro, top thing in the world. The guy who invented it is in Denver. My friend now is working privately with professional basketball players where their people can't fix their own players. 
That's how good this system is. Wow. So I take people who come in any level and they come for two weeks or a month and we add that in and give them top, top tennis coaching with how they need to, how they understand their body and if there's weaknesses and then that will prevent injury and they're on a special program. So it's a very highly lead thing that I'm doing with my players here if they come in. Sure. And then sometimes I don't have players, you know, and then I play a little bit of golf and obviously Davis Cup and putting all these infrastructures now for all the tournaments we're done to give yeah. opportunities for players to come and play and make points. So yeah. I'm blessed. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like you've got a, a lot uh, going on. And, and for anybody listening, I have, we'll, I have. We'll link to, we can link to all of that in the show notes as well so people can find all that information. Um, so, so how do you think about coaching? But most of the listeners are going to be in the you know, club level USTA 3035-4045 um, range. How do you think about strategy for those pl- players versus higher level kind of college or pro players? I always, when I do it, my wife, like I said, played Wimbledon, you know, and we played Wimbledon's together in mixed doubles. So we always run these camps, like a three hour camp where eight people sign up and I give them a booklet of every situation that will come up in doubles, whether you play Wimbledon or whether you at 2-0 level. Mm-hmm. And I start the conversation like this. I know that if you're a woman, that people like Serena and Halep and Brandy, uh, Brady and all those uh, players, if you're a guy, Federer, they all hit the ball better than you, but there's nothing wrong with your brain and theirs, you can still think like them. Mm-hmm. So let's address today, we're going to coach you doubles and we're going to tell you where the best shot is to hit when this situation come up, whether there's two at the front, two at the back, all four players at the back, one at the net, three at the back. So all three players, all four players, every time will know what is the best shot to try now? Mm -hmm. And then it's only the execution because what's happening when I'm watching doubles now, and I'm sure you, because you are also getting involved with strategy. We first want to eliminate that a 2.0 or a 4.0 or someone that's ranked 10 in the world, they don't try and hit shots that are just not the risk reward yeah. It's just not there. Yeah. So why try those shots if the best player in the world won't try that shot? Right. If we can, and then it's an art to explain to them why you shouldn't try it and why that shot is better. That's where the tricky part comes in. And that's how, mm-hmm. how to explain it has really made sense and how you're going to show it and play it out for them. That's why this is a three hour clinic I do. Mm -hmm. So then if you eliminate that, I think you already eliminate a lot of errors that will creep in. So for them just to believe that win or lose is not what it's about. In the beginning, it's make the right choices and then be in the right positions on the court. And a simple thing uh, that I know you're going to coach everyone that knows doubles a lot about it anyway is if your partner hits a great shot and that partner's partner is at the net and they poach and they run on the service line and poach. Yeah. Why? Yeah. No one is yeah. going to do that that understands that if you poach there, you've got to go five steps before you really will get to the ball. Right. And then you have to explain how close should that person be at the net? Mm -hmm. Because I am a total believer, the closer you are to the net, the worse volume you are. Now that's going to raise a lot of eyebrows, but (laughs) I'll just let that go also. But there are ways to play doubles and it's about decision-making singles also. 
they are basic yeah, yeah, plays absolutely. to structure points. And then you bring in the talent of the player where you can tweak it because, wow, they have this shot. So go against the rule and let them do that. Mm -hmm. So you talked about the risk reward, which is a great analogy. Um, I've, uh, I've got a blog post I wrote a long time ago about what poker can teach people about tennis because I think of everything in like odds kind of. Um, and like, what are the odds I'm going to make this down the yeah. line backhand? And what are the, you know, if I hit it 10 times, I miss it four times. They hit a volley winner twice, and then I win the point uh, the other four times. So I'm only winning 40% of those points. So that's not good enough. Um, so what are some common risks that you see people taking at that three, five, four level that they shouldn't be some common mistakes? There's, a, there's one very simple rule, and it's probably easier to show it on drawings, but one thing that is very important for me, you have to protect your partner. So there's a simple rule here. Mm -hmm. If your partner is at the net and you are at the back. Yeah. Now let's, let me step back. We are now going to assume that the two players we play are of equal level. Okay. Because that is another thing you're going to have to sort out who's weaker, who's better. And when right. you get to the pro level, you also know if this person has a weaker forehand or back end because you're good enough to get it to the side. But at 2-0 right. or 3-5 level, you just need to know which player is weaker. But let's assume for this to explain my theory here, that both opponents are the same level. Right. So if I'm playing with Will, and Will is at the net, and I'm at the back, and the opponents are on the other side, but the opponent is, or one of them is also at the net. Okay. If I hit to the opponent that's at the net, he's so close to my partner, he's gonna kill my partner. Mm -hmm. So I want to hit to the person the furthest away from my partner when my partner's at the net. It's a basic rule until proven wrong. Right. But what I see is, I give you the normal player keep hitting, but then the player at the baseline is not the player that's going to win the point for me. If I play with you at the net, well, you're going to win it for me. I'm going to set you up. But most of the time, the players in my position at the back feel after two shots, they have to do something now to win the point. It's like a singles right. mentality. Yeah. So that's one direction. of the simplest rules. Protect your partner. Think this is your wife when you were dating her and you were boyfriend, girlfriend, protect her. And this mm. is your best friend. You hit the wrong person, they're going to kill him. Right. And that's just a simple rule that I have. So, so it sounds like people just get a little impatient with the yes. court rally and they go down the line too early when it's not, not the right time. The best player in doubles is the one that's sometimes the most passive, the most quiet. You don't know, wow, he's doing nothing. And yeah. then the one who gets all the rewards is this guy who makes all these flashy plays and wins this point, that point, but they never yeah. knew that the silent partner set him up. Right. Yeah, the best. So players. don't worry. Do you just do you want to win or you want to be the hero? Mm -hmm. You have to make that decision before you play. Right. What's more important? So uh, any other mistakes you see at the at that club level? Uh, you know, it's hard to explain everything, but that is, I think it's shot selection. Like we do mm -hmm. say, that's why you got to kind of walk people through. Yeah. I think in the lower level, because people always look at TV and watch other players, the quicker they can understand that there's no perfect in tennis. Mm -hmm and not talk themselves out of 
when they play a bad shot because it's part of the game. You're going to play. And if your partner is not playing well, it's sometimes not good to coach them. It's better to go and just support them and then maybe go to the coach at the club after the match and say to the coach, listen, my partner, man, she missed 50, 25, 30 volleys or she couldn't return. Maybe if you have the private lesson with her, can you just check that out? But for you to coach your partner <laughs> on the tennis court, remember, they look at you as just a normal player like them. Right. So why should they listen to you? I know you, I know you mean well, but I think it's hurting someone more because they're already feeling pressure. Just support. Yeah. You'll never, you'll be amazed when someone plays and their muscles are relaxed or they enjoy playing with you because you just support them. They can switch in a match because they're not worried about how bad they play, what you are thinking. Now you want to try and help them. It right. actually doesn't, it's, you're not going to benefit from it. Let someone yeah. fix them and have them have them feel at ease with you. Let them want to play with you. And yeah. believe it, your time will come also where you have a bad match. And yeah, what would absolutely. you like them to tell you? Do you want them to start coaching? Hey, you got to stand further back. you got to do this. you got to do that. And the biggest thing that I was taught, and I do this with my players anyway, and this is also a good thing for whatever level you are, Every day you play, something is not going to work. It's not negative. It's just expect. Today, my phone is not working. Oh, yesterday, my serve was so good. Why can't I serve it today? There's always something in a match that works. I promise you there's something that works. Use that. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and in, in trying to come up with kind of game plans or strategies around scenarios where something does break down. So like if, if my forehand's not working today, like how, how can I mitigate that and like figure out go to the net, how to hit back and right? serve yeah, aces, exactly. you know, yeah, find absolutely. something that works. That's why when I do any clinic in doubles, I said the three biggest things to know about doubles. The first one in, huge is communication mm -hmm. second one communication the third one not as important as the first two it's communication <laughs> it's really how you talk to each other yeah yeah it's super important um yeah and it that was a good point about the the coaching so you know going to their coach after the match and telling their coach hey you know they struggled with their volleys today can you check it out um that's something that I, I tell uh, my readers of the newsletter and on the podcast a lot is, you know, during a match is, is probably the worst time to be coaching someone, um, especially uh, on technique. I see some people say like, oh, it looks like you're coming up on your forehand or something like in the middle of a match as if they're going <laughs> to fix their forehand technique like during a match. Technique um, is using the wrong side of the brain. It's 200 times slower than the subconscious. Rather tell the person then where to where to eat or come to the net or right. you want to serve volley. Any technical lesson while you play is the worst thing you can tell a player because it goes back to the conscious mind that is 200 times slower mm -hmm. and you're done. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well said, sense. well, perfectly said, well done. And, and a lot of um, a lot of the issue I, I feel like people have is just delivery. Like they're, sometimes they're trying to communicate the right thing, but they deliver it in a way that, um, that can seem like it's coaching too aggressively or it's, um, uh, it can be taken, um, kind of is a little bit demeaning and add pressure to that partner, you know? So um, anyways, yeah, we, we can go on and on about communication. When I do a seminar or I talk to people, I have two things I'll, I'll work on. 
And this actually happened. I had a conversation with Paul one day because we all understand the game. And he said, you know, there's a lot of coaches who understands the game. The best coaches knows how to explain it to the player. So I then took that and I live by this rule. If you coach a player and he cannot do it, it's your fault. Yeah. Don't blame the player. You either ask the player to do something that they physically not good enough. Example, the lady or the man is a 2.5 and you say, you got to kick the serve off the side of the box. It has to kick to the right. They are physically, it has to be done in a certain way. Maybe your body can't do it. If that's not the reason and you know they can do what you asked him, then you didn't explain it correct. Right. So you got to find out those are the two rules. And if you as a coach live by those two rules, I think the sky is the limit what your players can do. And that's trial and error. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. Um, So uh, I know you have to run here soon. I want to do a few more strategy questions. Uh, Earlier, you mentioned playing the deuce versus ad side. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think this is, again... This is debatable. There's no wrong, there's no right. But as a coach and seeing a team and kind of get to know them. So I have a feeling, I I might change, but I want you to think about this. And I hear this a lot. Best returner on the ad side, that's where all the important points are gonna be, break points. (laughs) Okay? Now, I'm not saying I won't change. I would just say I always have an open mind about this. So let's say now your best returner is on the ad side, the weaker one on the juice side. So when people serve to the ad side, they mostly gonna be up 15 left, 30, 15, 40, 30, because the weaker returner is on the juice, so the server should win more of the points. Correct? Yeah. Will the server be a little bit more aggressive, serving better second serves to the ad side? Because he's up. If he serves a double, he goes back to the juice side. He serves again there. Ah, easy, I'll win this point. No pressure on a second serve at 15-30, a 30-15, 40-30, okay? Because they're up. What happens if a server is every time or most of the time serving to the ad side, left 15, 15, 30, 30, 40? So let's speed this process up. Well, I'm on the due side. My wife is on the ad side. You serving to her at 30, 40. You miss your first serve. Are you going to serve just as good a second serve to her as you mm-hmm. would have if you served at 40, 30? Yes or no? Yeah. No, I'll probably double fault. <laughs> or, or you might aim it a little bit more to the middle. You might take sure. off five miles an hour. So right. suddenly my weaker return is also going to get a weaker, a weaker so. return of serve. Sure. And so there is quite an interesting theory. When I yeah. talked to someone that was the best juice side player in the world in the 1970s, he says he... He's, when they talked about him, mm-hmm. I talked to Stan Smith and uh, uh, Starley and uh, Newcomb and those people. Sure. And they said, Pesty Turner on the juice side. Yeah. Well, that was interesting. And then McEnroe actually came along and he was so good. Doesn't matter where he played. But maybe that thought will make you think in not just saying, Okay, the rule says best returner on the ad. Yeah, and yeah, I, I don't found know. that out. I found that out in mixed doubles. Uh huh. When the when the guy played on the juice, it was very interesting how you had to figure it out and think when you serve to the girl in mixed doubles. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know who came up with that rule. Um, I. I, it's funny you mentioned it because I, I had a podcast episode uh, about a month ago that I did on mixed doubles and I talked about that rule and, it, and you know, I, I didn't know who came up with it, but I talked about, you know, a lot of people say the guy should play the ad side 
Um, and I talked about why that is probably not necessarily true, but I didn't think of the pressure that it puts on the server. Um, the, the thing that I had thought about is if, if a game ends at 4015 or 1540, the player on the deuce court gets three returns and the player in the ad court only gets two. So at the end of the match- You cannot explain it right. better to someone what you just said. Let the yeah. better guy return more balls. But right. listen, there's exceptions. If you get sure, if they're sure, gonna sure. both play from the from the baseline yeah. when they return, then are you putting the, the two best shots if a backhand and a forehand, are you putting them at the baseline? So that's in the middle because that's where more of the opponents are volleying. Right. So there are different yeah. things to figure out. Let's just say everyone equal. It's quite an sure. interesting thing about the opponent serving then. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's uh, yeah, I hadn't thought about it like that, and it's definitely. Um, I, so I don't just have an open mind next time. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of these rules in tennis that people come <laughs> up with, and I'm just like, I, I'm not sure that's true. So, um, so I know I have to go soon, but so it's interesting. Can you see now how some coaches might figure something out, and then that team just wins and they do right. well and. And you look at the team, they do nothing different, but mm -hmm. they're winning. But you as a coach know exactly what your team is doing and why they're winning and no one else understands it. And then the same two people could be with a different coach and they're just struggling to win. So bless the coaches who are creative, finding out things and explore it. And then the players understand and enjoy and love it then the sky is the limit. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, so any, any last uh, kind of parting thoughts or, or requests of the audience before I let you go? Yes, I always finish all my Zooms with, and this is again in the communication, this is for parents who is just with their kids at the house, the kids doesn't even play sport just a general th uh, rule of thumb for me, whether you do coaching, whatever. Don't start a sentence with don't. The only sentence that starts with don't is the following sentence. Don't start a sentence with don't. <laughs> because every time people want to correct people, don't do that. Don't do that. They forget to look at something you want the player to do or you want your kid to do. Mm -hmm. I could have the best player here in the world. You're always gonna see things that you don't want them to do. It's not gonna work. But you don't need to tell them every time, don't do that, don't, don't, don't. They're gonna lose their self-esteem. They're not gonna feel they do anything right. And if, it's, it's a, a gain of art, but you can say it in a different way. Right. Instead of don't do that. If you do that, it's so better. Look what happened. Mm -hmm. And coaches who are coaching, if you can find a way to stop talking when your player makes a mistake in practice, find a way to correct that mistake without talking to him about it can you create something to work on it and when he does it right then tell him that shot was so good because your elbow was up now he thinks because his elbow is up that's why it was so good otherwise you can say don't drop your elbow don't drop your elbow you missed the ball don't drop your elbow so think just what the word don't will do to the person that you tell it to are you building him up or are you taking his self-esteem away from him? Mm -hmm. And that's how I'm trying to live my life. Wow. That's great advice. Um, I think we're definitely going to have to do a, a part two at some point. And <laughs> dive deeper into all of this. Uh, maybe next time I'm down in Austin, we can do it in person. Um, that would well, be um, listen, congratulations what you're doing. You know, I know it's a lot of organizational stuff and things, but uh, I hope the people enjoy what you're doing and, you know, you're taking doubles to another level and it's great. So hang in there, you know, I hope you get a lot more followers and 
I'm just about, uh, where are you in Dallas? In Fort Worth. Yeah, I'm only about, uh, what, three hours from you here in lovely Austin, Texas. Yeah, I, I'm down there a lot. So next time I'm in town, I'll let you know. Uh, okay, well, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And if they don't, then uh, <laughs> just delete me off the podcast then. <laughs> no, I'm sure they're going to love it. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Will. And uh, I'll text you the websites and stuff. If you liked that video, be sure to click the thumbs up button below to help support the channel. And for even more gear reviews, double strategies, and interviews with pro tennis players and coaches, don't forget to subscribe to our channel as well. And to sign up for our newsletter where you'll get double strategies and discounts on the latest tennis gear, go to thetennistribe.com.